Amen. It is good being here. Amen. We've had a good week and a good time getting to meet some of you fine folks, and uh, we appreciate all the fine cooking last night. We had a good time, probably too good of a time last night, actually. I think I ate a lot of food, a lot of food. I'm so glad that the pastor didn't get up this morning and say, gluttony can separate you from the love of God, because that would have been bad for some of you and me. Amen. But I'm so glad nothing separates us from the love of God. Amen. Amen. And we appreciate you uh, putting us up in your nice mission room up there. Uh, it's much nicer than any hotel room could have did for us. And we appreciate that. And as missionaries, you travel wherever you lay your head is home. So someone asked us where we live. We say we live at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Holbrook, Massachusetts. For really, I mean, this is home. And y'all are in my house. Amen. Thanks for coming to my house tonight. But we, we really enjoyed it. We really enjoyed a lot of you. And, and uh, thank you to the Hen family. for They cooked for us this afternoon, and we, we enjoyed that. and Gave us some nice beef jerky that I'm looking forward to after the service. And thanks to the Crump family for taking us out yesterday and putting up with us, and we appreciate them. And we appreciate the church, and we just pray that you'll pray for us, and we'll pray for you as we're going on. We're all on the same tier, same team here, amen? We're all out doing the things for Christ, but we thank you for everything you've done for us and for inviting us. This is our first meeting since we got off the field. We've only been home for about three weeks, and this is our very first meeting. I get a little nervous. I used to know how to do this, but I get up to preach, and I'm used to going for five words and stopping with a translator. So when I got back here, it's hard to get back into the, the root of things because I, I like to preach. But it's hard to, i got to start preaching in English again. It's hard for me to get going and stop, and going and stop. So I'm, I'm trying to work through that, so maybe a couple more churches I'll have it down. I just pray that you all bear with me as we get through it. But I thank you again for being here and being here on Sunday night. Amen. It looks like a good crowd. I appreciate that. I appreciate that good singing. You know, I hear songs like that. Here am I, Lord, send me. You know, I heard, I, I hope that when you sing songs like that, that you truly mean it. You know, A.W. Tozer said, Christians don't tell lies. They go to church and they sing them. That's a profound statement, friends. We sing songs like that. Here am I, Lord, send me, but we really don't mean that. I used to lead singing before the Sunday school, Sunday school hour in Tabernacle Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas, and I'd get up and sing songs like that, and I'd say, if you don't mean this, I don't want you to sing. Just sit right there and watch everybody else sing. We sing, here am I, Lord, send me. Do you truly mean that? From the bottom of your heart, if God told you to go to Africa tonight, you would say, I'll go, or Croatia, or China. Do you really mean it? You ask yourself, there's so much doctrine and, and, and convicting words in these songs that we sing, and they, they just prick our hearts. We sing untold millions, still untold. Let, your, let the light shine. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, amen? Let the lower lights be burning. But we really mean those songs that we sing. I pray that they'll become a part of you and want to change you. Ten years ago, it was during our mission conference, just like this, that God called me to, to, be, a, to be a missionary. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't so much to the preaching. You know what it was? It was a song. They take, they, take, they take hymns, and they put mission words to them. They sound just like the hymns, but they put mission words to them. And then some of those songs, man, they were just so convicting. And it was like, I remember one verse, it just... It just resonated up, up and down my soul. It talked about reaching the lost, and they'd never heard before, and it just it destroyed me. And it, it's just through the singing. So I hope when you do come and you sing, you, you truly mean it, and sing from your hearts. All right, that was free, amen? All right, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to 2 Kings chapter number 7. 2 Kings chapter number 7. This is probably one of the greatest mission stories in all the Bible. I believe, I'm biased, I'm a missionary, I think every story is about missions. I believe if you take missions out of the Bible, all you have left is the cover, amen? From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about missions to me. But this is one of the greatest mission illustrations in all the Bible, and I hope you agree, maybe you'll agree after the night is over. We're going to begin reading in verse number 3, but we're not going to read yet. We're going to read 2 Kings chapter number 3, and then we'll stand. But before we read, I want to bring you chapter 7, 2 Kings chapter 7, I'm going to bring you up to speed on where we're at in this story. 
So you'll get the gist of it. You'll understand what's going on. The story takes place in the times of Elisha. And the Bible tells us that Ben-Hadad is king of Syria at this time. And Syria is getting ready to go against Samaria. Syria doesn't like the Jews. Nothing new. We see it today. It always happened. It's happening here in the Bible times. If you, go, if you were to look back in 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 24, we'll just look at that before we stand. It says, And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. Now, this is what I believe he did. Ben-Hadad, we'll take the tip of this microphone. You see it up here? We're going to pretend the tip of this microphone is the city of Samaria. Okay? What I believe what Ben-Hadad did, he took his army and he set up camp all the way around this city. What he was trying to do was he was going to starve these people out. He was cutting off all their food supply that no food could get in and no food could get out. Nobody could go out and get food. He was going to cut off their food supply so after they got weak and tired and began to die, Ben Hadad could take his army in there and take over Samaria with no problem at all. And friends, it began to work. The Bible says that the famine got so bad in Samaria that they were selling donkey's head for 80 pieces of silver. Now, I don't know how hungry you can be to eat a donkey's head. I don't know how much meat is on a donkey head. We were at the hen's house today, and they were talking about eating sheep's head, I believe. Well, they eat sheep's head, sheep's head in Africa, South Africa. Well, I, I may eat a sheep. I don't know about a donkey, all right? A donkey, I, I just don't know. I don't know if they put it in a soup and stir it around and eat the eyeballs. I don't know. But they're hungry, okay? I want you to understand this. I want you to get the picture of how hungry these people are. It all makes sense. I want you to understand something. These people in Samaria are Jews. And there are certain things that Jews cannot eat. And a donkey is not one of them. Jews could not eat bacon, pork, shrimp, different things like that. I mean, it's been hard to be a Jew, amen? I mean, just last night, Mrs. Crump had some of those nice little wrapped up things with bacon and onion in them. I think I had about 25 of them, all right? Now, if I'd have been a Jew, that'd have been a bad thing, all right? But I'm not, all right? But Jews cannot eat certain things. It's unclean. It's an unclean animal to them. But friends, when you haven't eaten in many days and you're starving, you say, forget the law. Bring me some donkey head. Bring me two, amen? Not only were they eating donkey's head, if you look at verse 25, look at chapter 6 real quick. Look at verse 25 of chapter 6, 2 Kings. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until the ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. The Bible says they were eating dove's dung. Now, I looked that up, and some commentators say that dove's dung was a nasty vegetable, and that was the nickname they gave it, dove's dung. But some commentators said they were actually eating dove's dung. Now, some of you kids might not know what dung is. You can ask your parents about it later when you get home when you're eating dinner, okay? <laughs> but I want you to understand, you got to be awfully hungry to be eating some dove's dung, amen? Donkey head with some dove's dung sprinkled on it. That's nasty stuff. I want you to get the picture now, all right? Dinner's in a little while. But they're eating donkey's head, they're eating dove's dung. It got worse than that, friends. The Bible says they started eating their own children. The king was walking through there, and the lady cried out and said, King, king, help us. He said, hey, how can I help you? What's going on? And she said, me and this other lady, we, we made a deal today. She said, today we'll take my baby, we'll boil my baby, we'll eat my baby today. And tomorrow, we'll take your baby and boil it and eat it tomorrow. And king, today, yesterday we boiled my baby and we ate my baby. And today, it's time to eat. And she has hid her baby from us. Tell her to bring her baby out here so we can eat. That's a sad condition the state of, the state of Israel is in. Brother Glenn preached, talked about it this morning in Sunday school, where they would start eating their own children. That was a great Sunday school lesson, by the way. Amen. It was very good. But that's what he was talking about, just like that. It's going on right now. They're eating their own kids. Samaria, they're, they're starving to death. Now, when we get to our story, we're going to talk about four lepers. If you know anything about leprosy in the Bible, lepers could not live within the city limits. They could not live in Samaria, in the city walls. They had to live outside the city walls because they were unclean people. Every day, every day, everywhere they went, their hair was shaved. They had to wear dirty old ratty clothes. And when they saw people, they had to cover their mouths and shout, unclean, unclean. You're talking about a humiliating life. 
And you have to live outside the city walls. You're outcast to society. Nobody wants to be around you. You're a leper. And friends, the only food that lepers got was usually food from the inside. Maybe they had some family. Maybe they had some friends that would bring them some food, a food basket, maybe throw it at them and give it to them. But during this famine, hey, I already told you what they're eating on the inside. They're eating donkey's head, they're eating dove's dung, and they're eating their own children. So what do you think the lepers have? Man, they have absolutely nothing. They're starving beyond degree. They don't have no babies to eat. They don't have no donkey head to eat. They are starving beyond degree. And this is where we're going to get to our story. If you, if you have, find your place, please stand for the reading of God's word. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse number 3. The word of God says, And there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall into the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live, and if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the kings of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight, and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carry thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. And this is the verse I want you to concentrate on tonight. Then they said one to another, we do not well. This day is a day of good tidings and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight. We thank you for this mission week. Father, I pray if there's somebody in this room, Father, who's not saved, Father, they'll be saved tonight. Father, I pray for the Christians in the room tonight, Father, if they're not totally surrendered. To ask that same, Paul, that same question the Apostle Paul asked, Lord, what will thou have me to do? God, I pray that you call some missionaries out of this church. Father, I pray that you bless me and use me this night to be encouragement to your people. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So now you see these four lepers. They look at each other. They're starving beyond degree. They say, guys, if we sit here, we're going to die. You know what we should do? Let's get up. Let's go out there to that Syrian army. If they give us food, great. If they take a sword and cut off our head, great. We have nothing to lose. I'd rather die by the sword than die by starvation. Amen? Starvation could take days. A sword would be quick. Kill us. So the, Syrian, the, the lepers get up and they start walking out there. And while they're walking out there, the Lord had made the host of the Syrian army to hear a noise of horse and chariots. And the Syrian army looked at each other and said, guys, they're coming to get us. Let's get out of Dodge as fast as we can. And they dropped and left everything. They left it all. Food, gold, raiment, they left it all. So when the lepers got there, guess what? <whistles> Four lepers, Syrian camp. Oh, man. You're talking all-you-can-eat buffet, amen? <laughs> Y'all got Golden Corral up here? Y'all have an all-you-can-eat buffet? Yeah. Chinese buffet? You know what I'm talking about. It looked like the fellowship hall last night, all right? Food everywhere. Four lepers, haven't eaten in days, and boy, they're starving. Boy, the Bible tells us they go and they start eating. They start taking that stuff. And How many of you, y'all like McDonald's? How many of you have, been ever, have ever been eating McDonald's french fries so fast you accidentally bit your finger? None of y'all have never done that? Y'all pray for me then. I've done it. When them things are good and your fingers don't get out. I bet these lepers are doing that. I mean, hey, they haven't eaten in days, friends. They're starving. I mean, they're stuffing their face. They probably got food all over them. I mean, they're having the time of their life. The Bible says they take the gold and silver and they're going and hiding it, digging holes or setting up retirement for years to come, all right, for all their kids and grandkids. They're having the time of their life. And I want you to notice something, friends. They didn't do nothing for it. It was freely provided for them. Free, friends. They didn't do nothing for it. It was there when they got there. And they're having the time of their life. 
And while they're eating and stuffing their faces, their bellies are getting full, they realize something. They realize something. They say, guys, something's not right. We're sitting here stuffing our faces. Our bellies are full. We have everything we possibly need. And just a few miles away, people are starving. They're eating donkey's head, and they're eating dove's dung, and they're eating their own kids. And our bellies are full. We're eating. They say, friends, we do not well. They realized, friends, that they had the greatest news in the land, and they were keeping it to themselves. What was that news? That nobody need go hungry. There's enough food here for everybody. Come and eat. And it's free. You don't have to pay nothing. All you have to do is come. That's the greatest news in the land at that time, friends. And those lepers realized we cannot keep it to ourselves, friends. We do not well. They had the greatest news in the land. They weren't telling nobody. Friends, you can see the story. You can see the significance here. You can see the similarity here. You and I had the greatest news. Not, not just the land and all the world, friends. The gospel message. The world is starving without the gospel. 3.2 billion souls. We sing that song, Untold Me and Still Untold. Friends, that's an understatement. There's literally billions of people still untold. They're starving without the gospel. You and I have it if we're not doing nothing to get it out. Giving to missions, praying for missions, going as missions. Friends, we do not well. we got to get it out, friends. We cannot keep it to ourselves. We have the greatest news in all the world. Curtis Hudson said this. I put it on my, my, my video the other night. He said the only way we're going to evangelize the world is when the evangelized become evangelists. Who are the evangelized? Those who have received the gospel, heard it, received it, accepted it, you've been evangelized. Now, when you become evangelists, we can reach the world. What's that mean? When you start taking it out to others, doing something to get the gospel out to other people. We can reach the world. We can do it. Some Christians say, ah, we can't do it. They have no faith or they have lack of interest, like Brother Carney said tonight, lack of interest. That's sad. A missionary, lack of interest. Souls are dying. Starving, going to hell, and he has lack of interest. Do you have interest tonight in the souls and the men and women all around the world, friends? We have the greatest news in all the land. We can't, we can't keep it to ourselves. Y'all come to church every week. Some of you do. I don't know if everybody does. You're here on Sunday night. Amen. Looks like a good crowd. You probably come on Wednesday night. Amen. You come on Sunday morning. I heard someone say, when you come to church on Sunday morning, you love the church. When you come to church on Sunday night, you love the preacher. When you come to church on Wednesday night, it's because you love the Lord. I know a lot of people work. Some people just, SpongeBob is more important sometimes. But you come, and you're fed every week. Brother Carney preaches the gospel. I heard it this morning, loud and clear. It was plain. Can't argue with it. You're come, you're fed that stuff. He's teaching you doctrine, doctrine of justification, reconciliation. Hey, I love all that stuff. That's good stuff. Amen. He come and he feeds you by the shovel full. And you sit here and you're getting big and bigger and bigger spiritually. You're being fed, all right? You're being fed. Amen. You want to go to a church that you're being fed. But after we get fed, friends, you know what we got to do? We can't keep all that stuff to ourselves. We got to go share it with others. Amen? Amen. I know when you were little, your mom taught you, hey, if you're out eating a popsicle and your friend's sitting next to you, did she say, just eat that popsicle in front of them? No. What does she tell you to do? If that person next to you doesn't have it and you have something, what are you supposed to do with it? Share it. If you have the gospel and the person next to you doesn't have it, what are you supposed to do? Hey, that's a good class. Amen. Share it. It's simple, friends. Hey, what good is it if you come to church every week and learn the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation? You learn the whole Bible by heart and you never tell anybody about it. What good is it? It benefits you. But friends, it's not all about us. It's not all about us. It's all about him. And I believe when you look at him and say, Lord, I've done all I can. I've learned your Bible. He's going to say, okay, go tell somebody else about it. Go tell them what you've learned. They're starving without it. You know it. You got it. You're fed. And there's people starving all around you. Not just in Croatia, friends. Right across the street. Right here in this Boston, great New England area. We need churches. They say seven churches close a week in America. Seven churches. 
That's sad, friends. People are starving. I believe the Lord's coming back. Amen? Amen. He's coming back. I think he's getting ready to close the curtain on this, this show. Now, friends, we should be more determined now, more dedicated now to get the gospel out than ever there was a time. There's more lost people in the world today than there ever has been in history. 3.2 billion, billion people. And they're starving, friends. You got the greatest news in the land. Secondly, they realize. I want you to look at verse number nine. In the middle of that verse, first they realize they had the greatest news in all the land. They said, we do not wail. This is the day of good tidings and we hold our peace. Secondly, they realize if we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. They realize this, friend. They realize the danger of holding their peace. What was that danger? Well, that Syrian army could have got halfway down the road and said, hey, guys, I think we were just hearing things. I don't think there was really no horses. Let's go back. And they went back, and they found these four lepers eating all their food and hiding all their gold. What do you think that Syrian army would do to those guys? Curtains. You know what I mean? They've been over for them guys. But worse than that, what if some of the people in Samaria would have had the same idea that the lepers had? What if they said, hey, we're, if we stay in here, we're going to die. Let's go out there to the Syrian army. If they kill us, great. If they give us some food, great. And the people in Samaria walked out there, and they found these four lepers eating, having the time of their life. Now, the people in Samaria might have knew these guys, probably knew them by name. They said, hey, guys, what are y'all doing out here? I see that you're stuffing your faces. Did you realize that we're eating our own kids in there? We're dying in there. We're falling by the hundreds, and you sit out here and stuff your face. Why don't you come and tell us? You see the danger? Why don't you come and tell us? We're just a couple miles away. We're dying. Friends, the danger that you and I have when we hold our peace, people are dying and going to hell. They're dying and going to hell if we hold our peace. And you must realize, friends, we're all going to give an account one day. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. We're all going to stand before Christ one day, give an account of what we've done in this life, in this Christian life, and what we've done with his wonderful gospel. Did we keep it to ourselves? Did we share it with anybody? Or did we hide it? Brother Carney talked about that this morning. Hey, if you hide it, you're not hiding it from him. You're not hiding it from the church. You're hiding it from a lost and dying world, friends. And you're going to give an account one day. God told Ezekiel, I said, he, he set him up a watchman. He said, when you see the sword coming upon the land, you're supposed to sound the alarm, sound the trumpet. And if you sound the trumpet and the sword comes and they die, hey, the blood's on their head. But if you see the sword coming and you don't sound the alarm and you don't warn those people and they die, guess what? The blood is going to be on your hands. I sung about that this morning. A lady in my home church wrote that song. And boy, I started, I, first time I heard it, it just brought me to tears. I thought, my soul. Now everywhere I go, I sing it. It's a convicting, convicting song still today. I never told him. Blood's going to be required at my hand. Paul told the Corinthians, he went there and preached the gospel. A lot, of people, a lot of people accepted it. Some people said, hey, I don't want nothing to do with it. And he said, all right, the blood's on your head. Hey, he went out and warned them. He told them they don't have to accept it. His job is to deliver it, to get it out. Whether they accept it or not, that's up between them and God. And Paul did it. That's what he did, friends. We're all watchmen. We're going to give an account one day. We've got to see the danger of holding our peace. People are dying and going to hell. They're starving. We must realize we have the good news. And lastly, I want you to look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. Lastly, they realized they had to tell the good news. They had to tell the good news. Now, like I told you before, these lepers were not liked. They're the outcast of society. Nobody wants them. They can't even live in the city walls. One of them probably said, hey, guys, we got to go tell the rest of the city. And one of the lepers probably said, hey, they don't like us. They don't want nothing to do with us. We're lepers. They're not going to listen to us. And the other ones probably said, guys, it doesn't matter. We have to go tell them. We cannot keep this good news to ourselves. We have to. Whether they like us or not, we got to go. And they win. You and I as Christians, guess what? The world's not going to like you. When you're out there door knocking, passing out tracks, hey, some of those people will not like you at all. They will cuss you. They would say things to, to hurt your feelings. I used to go out. We used to go out in Croatia. We used to hold signs. The big old bus ministry would come by. Kids 
Hundreds of kids would come out of school, and we would stand on the sidewalk. We'd have gospel signs. And it broke my heart, some of those kids, those teenagers on those bus. And my sons would be out there holding the sign. And those teens would come by the bus, and they would hold up those gospel signs. Only Jesus saves. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And those teenagers would look at that bus, and they'd give my sons the finger. They'd give me the finger. But it broke my heart to see those peers, the same people their age, giving my sons the finger. They're out there holding up the gospel signs, warning them, trying to tell them that Jesus saves. And all they did was want to give them the finger, laugh at them. But my sons, my sons kept going out there. They sure did. I'm proud of my boys going there. It broke my heart to see the teenagers doing that to my boys. But friends, that's the world we live in. Jesus said, hey, they persecuted me. They're going to persecute you. Friends, they're not going to like us. They're going to stomp. They're going to laugh at us. They're going to tear up our tracks. But friends, we still have to go. We still have to go. These lepers had a have-to mentality. They said, I have to, guys. I have to. It's not preference. It's duty. We must go. We can't stay. I heard a story about a school in Texas. There was a, there was a, a school in Texas where they allowed Muslim kids to pray three times a day. And the, and the Baptist kids there, the Christians there, they wanted to have a prayer time. And the, and the school said no. Well, some Baptist preachers got in to think about it and said, hey, this ain't right. So they went to court. They said, we got to get this settled. You, you, the, the Muslim kids can't pray and we can't either. So they went to court, and they gave them their fight, and the Baptist preachers put up a good fight. But in the end, they lost. They lost the case. And the Baptist preachers that looked at the judge and said, hey, why? And the judge looked at those Baptist preachers and said, it's because of this. Those Muslims have to pray. They have to do those things. You Baptists serve according to preference. And I thought, my soul. You know what? He's probably right. We do serve according to preference. Y'all didn't have to be here tonight. I believe you came because you love the Lord. Y'all don't have to be here Wednesday night. But I believe you come because you love the Lord. Some of you come because you feel that you have to come. Because God gave his life for you, so you're going to do all you, think, all you can for him. You have a have-to mentality. But a lot, a lot of Baptists say it's preference. I don't have to, but I don't want to. You're right. Muslims have to do those things. If they want salvation, they have to do those things. We just... We got, we're free in Christ. We can do whatever we want. No, friends. All Christ has done for us. He died for us. We should want to die and live for him. Have a have-to mentality. I have to. The apostle Paul had it. He said, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. He said, necessity is laid upon me. It was a have to. It wasn't preference to the Apostle Paul. He said, man, he said, guys, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. He says, I'm a debtor to those men. Why? Because he borrowed some money from them, never paid them back? No. Because he had something that they didn't have. You know what that was, friends? The gospel of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm a debtor. They don't have it. I have it. I'm a debtor to them. I got to give it to them. I have a have to mentality. I got to. It wasn't a choice. It wasn't preference. It was obedience, friends. We sang that song the other night, Rescue the Perishing. Duty demands it. Not preference. Duty demands it. Christ gave his commission, friends. He wasn't joking. I don't believe he was smiling. I believe he was serious about it. And it's a command. You and I must also do it. We've got to have a have-to mentality. The Apostle Paul knew that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that really changed lives. He says, well, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. The power of God unto salvation. I look for that word power in the Bible, and it's the Greek word dunamis. It's where we English-speaking people get the word dynamite. Amen? This little track right here, this is the gospel message. It's like a little stick of dynamite. If I were to put it in this young man's hand, and I were to light that stick of dynamite, and it were to go off, it would change his life. You believe that? If I put a stick of dynamite in his hand and lit it, and it went off, it would change his life. Yeah, you better believe it would. Not only will it change his life, it will change those lives around him. And that's what the Apostle Paul knew. He said, man, if I can get this gospel into people's hands, it will change their life. Not only will it affect their life, it will affect all those lives around them. Hey, these little tracks, buddy, these are like little sticks of dynamite. I know of three missionaries on a foreign field today because why? Because somebody gave them a track. On a foreign field reaching people all over the world because somebody gave them a track. You know one of the greatest 
problems your pastor should have, Brother Carney should have? The greatest problem he should have in the church, and he shouldn't have many, but one of them should be keeping the track rack full. He should come into church and say, man, we're all out of tracks again. They want to kick something. I say, Brother Crump, get on the phone. Go us some more tracks. Church members keep taking these tracks and hand them out all over town. We'll have a problem. He should have that problem. Friends, these little things are amazing. One of the greatest missionaries of all time, Hudson Taylor. You probably read about him before. You know how he was saved? By reading the track. Hey, this is easy stuff, friends. Hey, this is, the, this is the greatest news in all the land. We got to get it out. There's a track rack back there on your way out. Grab a stack full of them. Leave them wherever you go. You'd be amazed. You may not see the results on this time, but hey, it's your duty to give it out, friends. It's your duty to give it out. And if you keep it to yourself, you're not doing anything about it, you're not praying for missionaries, giving to missionaries, friends, we do not well. Someone asked Charles Spurgeon. They said, Mr. Spurgeon, for those who've never heard the gospel, can they be saved? And Mr. Spurgeon said this. He said, that's not the question with me. Here's the question with me. That those who have the gospel and never tell anybody, can they be saved? Those who have the gospel and never tell anybody, can they be saved? That's the question, friends. Are we keeping it to ourselves? Friends, 11 years ago, I was like one of these lepers. I didn't have nothing. But when I met Christ, it changed me. It changed everything about me. It went off. The power of God and salvation went off in my life. And it changed me, friends. And I'm like one of those lepers. Croatia is like my Samaria. Those people over there, you know what they have? Catholicism, 9% Catholicism. There's Islam over there. Mormonism, Jehovah Witness, New Age, atheism starting to spread. You know what all that stuff is? You know what all those religions are? Those are unclean things those people are eating. Unclean like those donkey heads that those Jews were eating. Hey, those people in Croatia are eating unclean things. You know what they need? They need the bread of life. This is it. This is what those people in Croatia need. This, friends, this is what the world needs. Croatia is my Samaria. I, I'm just like one of those lepers going over there. Charles Spurgeon said, this, th this thing of missions, this thing of soul winning is nothing but this. A little phrase that you can remember for the rest of your life. You probably heard it. This thing of telling other people about Christ, missions, giving to missions, it's all this wrapped up. It's one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. That's all these lepers did. Hey, they found a fast supply of food and they said, guys, we got to go tell these people who are starving. And that's what they did. They went and they had a time. Friends, you and I, we found something. It was free, provided for us. We didn't do nothing for it. We have it. Half the world doesn't have it. And we cannot keep it to ourselves, friends. We've got to tell other people about it. If we keep it to ourselves, we're not doing nothing to get the gospel out to a lost and dying world, friends. We do not well. And we are definitely not doing what God wanted us to do. We're being disobedient to his command. And I know y'all don't want to be that. I know you don't want to be that. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never been saved before. Friends, you're going you're to find yourself starving when you stand before God. God said, he that cometh to me shall never thirst. He that believes me shall never hunger. You need Christ tonight. If you're not saved tonight, I pray that you come and be saved. Don't wait. Don't put it off. But if you're here tonight and you are saved, realize something. You have the greatest news in all the world, friends. And people are starving all around you in your own street. They're dying without it. And you have it. If you keep it to yourselves, we do not well. Let us stand. Let us pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for tonight. And God, we just pray that you would just break people's hearts. Father, I pray that you break my heart more and more every day. Give us a burden.